We're next going to invite um, Brian and Avad up to speak to us um, about getting sparky with it. Um, Brian Davis is a data scientist on the Jobs Models team. He joined Indeed in 2015 after completing his MS in Statistics and Operations Research in North Carolina. At Indeed, he designs optimal bidding strategies for marketing campaigns and builds models to predict the performance of jobs on Indeed's website. He also has been a pioneer at Indeed in the use of Spark for data munging and model building. Avad Patel is a software engineer on the Jobs Models team where he focuses on building products that integrate machine learning models. He joined Indeed in late 2018. Before that, he was at Oracle Research Labs, identifying performance bottlenecks in databases and deep neural nets for next generation CPU designs. He holds a PhD in computer architecture. At Indeed, Avad optimizes machine learning deployment process to increase the rate of new model deployments and dynamically select a model based on input features. So welcome, Brian and Avad. Thank you very much. So uh, um, thank you very much, Kristen. Um, as mentioned, I'm Brian Davis, data scientist. And I'm Avad Patel, engineer at Indeed. Um, and I will be, today we'll be talking through a few different uh, aspects. Some of them are a little bit more data science-y, some of them are a little bit more engineering. So we'll invite Vod back up shortly to cover uh, the latter portion of this, and then we'll join uh, for questions in the end. Today we're here to talk about getting sparky with it. No, 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 right? <laughs> okay, good. Um, well, really what we're talking about is how we have used, leveraged Spark as well as other systems uh, to build an integrated machine learning pipeline at Indeed. Um, specifically, we are going to cover how we have integrated homegrown systems with open source solutions, which is very similar to the t talk we just heard. How we have leveraged Spark and come up with a way to deploy models that are uh, created in Spark into a low latency web product. And in general, some, how we've improved some of the data science processes at Indeed for ourselves and hopefully things that can be leveraged, not just at Indeed, but also at other teams. So the context, um, the product context, because I think keeping the product context and the user context is important. Keeping that in mind is important. So this is a screen that people are greeted, in, greeted with if they are posting a job on Indeed. Um, and we would love for them to choose to spend money on the product and choose to basically sponsor their job advertisement. Um, and we would like for them to have an idea of how uh, sponsorship will help their performance. So there are a few components of this that are actually generated by machine learning models. Um, the recommended budget that we see uh, on the top is generated by a recommended budget model. And the part at the bottom uh, is generated by an apply estimator model, which basically takes as inputs several features about the job and attempts to predict performance based off of performance historically of similar jobs. You could see here that the recommended budget of $15 is sort of there by default. So people can alter that amount uh, up and down and the estimates will change. So this is something that needs to be quick and responsive and it's something that actually runs on the boxcar infrastructure that Maya just mentioned. So we've been doing a lot of work to make big improvements in our data science process. And what is that process? Well, um, I have come up with a list of the essential verbs of productionized machine learning, and I know that's a bit of a mouthful, but forgive me here. And I'm going with the first verb instead of munch as wrangle, because I think that wrangling's better than munging generally as a word. And I think wrangling describes a lot of working with systems as well as data. So cleaning data, of course, and knowing where data comes from and getting it all joined together is the process, uh, uh, is part of wrangling. Also wrangling with the systems, making these systems return uh, the thing that you want, making sure that you understand where, how the data is generated, where it's coming from. Next, of course, we have training of a model. So every machine learning model must be trained in some capacity, um, although I suppose it could be trained online, but in this case, we're doing all of our training off of line. Then if we have a trained model, we deploy that to production. And finally, we would like to monitor its performance because we are responsible owners of deployed machine learning, and we want to make sure that when we release something into the wild that it's not misbehaving in crazy ways as models can. Well, 
All of that says, it sounds really nice, four clear steps. Why don't we just go do it? Well, it's easier said than done. Um, how many of you, by the way, are practitioners of data science or work in ancillary roles? Can anybody hands? Okay. So a fair number. Engineering backgrounds? All right, great. We're going to have stuff for both of you. Don't worry. Um, so yes, we have had quite a few challenges at every single stage here. And I'm not going to uh, let you take a detailed look at all of the different challenges we've had because it's our airing our dirty laundry. But suffice to say that we've done a lot of work over the last year and a half to resolve many of these issues at each of these four stages. And so today, the theme of our talk and sort of how it's organized is around five big moves and how these moves at different stages of this process have enabled us to integrate our data science process and in general uh, make a lot of people's lives easier uh, and hopefully imp imp come up with some cool technology in the process. The first move is a new data store. The second is new tools for ETL and I will do my best to define these uh, acronyms here as we throw them in. ETL being extract, transfer, load, basically describing the process of munging data, of, uh, of, con of um, loading your data from a place, extracting it from a place, transforming it in whatever form you need to, and um, finally loading it elsewhere. Model configuration in our training process and we'll get into more of what all these mean, Applying an uh, automated model deploy process, and finally, a system for continuous evaluation. So we have these five big moves. Each of these five big moves have technology components which will come into play. Hive has been a big improvement in our new data store. New ETL tools, we have leveraged Spark with a library called Yabi, which is written at Indeed. We have the model config, which leverages the Spark machine learning library with a library called model config, well, um, which basically enables for Spark machine learning library to be much easier to use. We have our model service, uh, which in our case is a boxcar service. And we have continuous evaluation enabled by data Datadog and our own internal, wor internal work on model evaluator. So, to get started, big move number one. So, Imhotep. Imhotep, anyone familiar with Imhotep in the off chance? Any old Austin, Austin tech people? Okay, we have a few, yes. But indeed, and people nat native to Indeed certainly know about Imhotep. Imhotep is one of Indeed's um, oldest open source projects, and it is a really, really fast online analytics platform. It is built by Indeed, so there's a lot of people that add Indeed who have knowledge of how this system works. It is very fast for aggregations, so we use it for monitoring how our products perform um, in, and monitoring, monitoring business metrics, um, and typically speaking, Imatep uh, indexes, as we call them, so these are Imatep data sources, um, are deeply tied into the way that we evaluate the performance of our products from a business perspective. It's really great for analysis. It's very great for online streaming analysis. The queries run very quickly. However, it has a few problems or potentially a few areas where it doesn't serve all the needs. First of all, it's not used outside of Indeed very much at all. Um, despite its being open source, it has been adopted in a, by a few different companies, but it's not, it's not typical that somebody coming into Indeed will know how to use Imatep indexes. And so uh, this is similar to the problem uh, Maya mentioned of something coming in with uh, knowledge of an open source platform, but not being able to use that knowledge at Indeed because there's a lot of internal systems that are specific here. It is slow for row level operations. So if we want to um, recover a definition of a data row as we might think of it in a database, Imatep, by virtue of the way that it stores its data, does not make that very easy. And for that same reason, it is somewhat inefficient for training models because we have to reconvert all of our data back to a row format to recover anything like the matrix that we would use in a machine learning model. So we have a case for Hive, and I uh, really, the, in, in arranging this presentation, I've come to love um, the Hive logo here, which is the Hadoop elephant's head on the B, which really creative use here. Um, so Hive, I guess 
Hive, if people are not familiar with it, is a distributed data store system uh, and, and um, kind of a, a distributed data meta store capable of interfacing with various other things in the Hadoop ecosystem. And Hive has just begun to begun be, uh, be adopted at Indeed. One thing nice about Hive. Well, we have in SQL or something similar with HiveQL. We have it using a data format called ORC, uh, which stands for Optimized Row Columnar Format. And this particular format is a great way to have efficient data storage and efficient data retrieval for machine learning systems. We have fast and reasonable row level operations, and we also have a large community. We, ha we can leverage the fact that this talent exists out in the market and that people can become experts at this technology uh, in places other than Indeed. So the big move number one has been a move from Emotep, an Indeed built system, into Emotep with Hive and Orc. So still using these, leveraging these internal technologies for the sake of analytics, but simultaneously having a lot of our data replicated to new, new formats and new storage mechanisms whereby we can use it more easily for the machine learning purposes. A movement from IQL, which is a Emotep query language, which is like our own special version of SQL, to something that uses much, something much, uh, much closer to conventional SQL. And finally, and overall, um, a movement from internal tools to internal tools integrated with open source tools. So big move number two from wrangling pigs to sparking fire. You'll have to forgive my uh, overblown metaphors here, but has anyone worked with the pig language? Yes. Does anyone find it like wrangling pigs? Because I, I have found it very close to that experience. Although I've never wrangled pigs, I can imagine it being similar. So this is the Apache pig logo, which I think is another great example of a, a logo. I don't know if that's aged at all. I think it's just fabulous. So what is Apache Pig? Apache Pig is a language for expressing MapReduce jobs, an abstraction above MapReduce to express data manipulation, data transformation in a way that is slightly easier than writing raw MapReduce, raw, raw Java jobs. It is extremely customizable, as in it interfaces with the rest of the Java ecosystem and therefore can take advantage of everything that else that might exist in the Java ecosystem. Um, so you can uh, write all of the user-defined functions that you need uh, for Pig. Um, it's also very established. It's been around a little while. It was a project, uh, I think, born in the 90s out of, at Yahoo. Um, and it was, at its time, very cutting edge uh, to kind of uh, dis to as, a, uh, as an abstraction on MapReduce. However, it is significantly harder than SQL to learn and, and express things in. Um, it has a lot of boilerplate. And for example, I was looking at a pig script uh, with my colleague earlier today, and the uh, last two thirds of a, maybe or the last thousand lines of a 1500 line pig script were just restatements of naming fields due to some strange naming conventions that pig has. Um, it also, but while being established, it has a shrinking community. There aren't a lot of people uh, in the uh, industry right now who are becoming new experts in PIG. There also um, aren't a lot of people at Indeed who know it really, really well. Um, and so for that reason, we might find there's a case for Spark. So this is where we start getting sparky with it. So Spark as an alternative to PIG in many capacities, has the ability to express our data pipelining processes in SQL, which is a language that is far more broadly understood and broadly used in industry. For anyone that has come from a graduate school, uh, and this is especially true for people from my background in statistics, um, or people that have worked, taken uh, master's degrees in data analytics or PhD students, they're often coming from a background of doing most of their programming in either R or Python. And those uh, frameworks have a data frame API that can be naturally um, kind of extended to include Spark. So Spark's data frame API is a very natural extension of what people are going, of what people are already skilled in. 
There is a fewer need for UDFs generally compared to PIG because there are a lot of things that are natively wrapped into the Spark, uh, uh, all of the native SQL, um, native SQL aggregation functions are also included in Spark. Um, as with PIG, but slightly differently than Python or R, it does also interface with the JVM, with the Java, Java systems, and that allows us to continue to use all of our other aspects of our Java ecosystem, and indeed is a language agnostic company, but a lot of our machinery, core machinery, is built in Java. It has native support for Parquet and Orc. And so those are two data formats that are very widely used. They have a lot of uh, benefits in terms of compression and speed. Um, we can also run Spark locally quite quickly, um, which is very nice, uh, especially if we're iterating on a task in which we would like to test whether it performs on a local data set before spinning this up on a larger distributed system. We also have it uh, ability to make Spark interface with Python and the Jupyter Notebooks. And there is a large community um, of people contributing to Spark and also people who are knowledgeable about it. It's probably one of the hot new things as far as open source projects go. So Spark is great. However, there are a few things that still make Spark um, sometimes painful to work with. There is, similar to PIG, a lot of boilerplate. There can be a very difficult process of getting Spark set up at a company for the first time, or even set up on your machine for the first time. Um, it can be difficult to configure. Um, so we would love a way to take these hard parts and kind of abstract them away and just leave the good parts. And that is what we have with Yabi. So Yabi is yet another way to build an index. And Yabi is a Indeed library written by a data scientist named Eric Scott, who is not here tonight, but who has uh, worked with our team for the past year um, to take away all of the annoying parts of Spark and just leave the fun parts. So making Spark ETL easy. So we get to look at this config file, which is um, exciting. And we get to examine this piece by piece. We get to see that we define variables in this config file. This will be the first of many config files that we make you look at tonight, so get ready. We have something where we're defining the views, which is basically where we're actually defining our data frames step by step. We are defining how we, uh, which data sources we're looking at, uh, what time periods we're looking at, um, and the format that those data sources exist in. Uh, log, in this case, is a, particular, is a format particular to Indeed, the way that we store logs. We have the SQL that will be run against this data source. And we have the outputs. So if we want to directly output this to some other place, we can specify that here. In this case, we are writing this to a location on the Hadoop file system, data slash click counts in the Parquet format, so Parquet data format. Yabi has another benefit, which is um, if we, uh, we'll explore that a little, bit, a little bit. So let's take, for example, the fact that we can express a simple um, ETL, a simple processing in a configuration file. So similar to the configuration file we just saw, we can imagine a configuration file A here, pulling from data source one and data source two. And we can imagine data source, uh, or configuration B, uh, pulling from data source three and data source four. And we are able to have these completely modular and share configuration on, as far as Spark is concerned, but they're different files. And then we can also have another configuration that actually inherits from the previous ones. So we can imagine this being somewhat akin, if people are familiar with SQL, to a long with statement, where you gradually build up a, data, data, a, a final data set step by step by step, except that we have modularized that with statement. And one of the advantage of advantages of modularizing that with statement is that we can write tests around each of these components. So we can supply sample data to fill in the tests, and we can test that our data pipeline is performing exactly the operations we think it is. And that is actually quite difficult to do in another environment, especially a pig script where you just have one large execution and all you can test is the final relation. And if you make any changes throughout that, you, it can be very, very difficult to identify where in your process that went wrong. 
And that is also true for SQL unless you modularize similarly your SQL statements. So this allows for a natural way to modularize the ETL process. So a case for Yabi, no Scala needed unless you really want it. There's no rebuilding of your project necessary. When you change something in a configuration file, you can run the same thing with a new configuration file. It's still highly customizable. If we want to go down to the underlying Scala, if we want to write in the raw data frame API, we can. We have newly implemented mem memory monitoring to allow it to work efficiently or examine its efficiency over, the, over a cluster. And we have a really great framework for testing data pipelines, which is one of the things that actually makes me as a data scientist most excited because I am very concerned about in data integrity. So move number two has been a movement from MapReduce to Spark, from Pig to SQL, and from Scala increasingly to being able to express things in this Yabi format, which is a configuration file. Big move number three, model config. So, as we just saw, the, uh, in a conventional mo uh, data manipulation process, we had potentially a mix of uh, raw SQL uh, um, executed against Spark data frames. And we might also see uh, people using the data frame API. And so we, kind of, we can sometimes have a, cha a chaotic mix between those two frameworks. Um, similarly, with the Spark model building process, we might find that um, there's a, a, a mix of different, uh, of different sort of ways of attacking this code. So we, we might have um, data frame manipulation at this point, um, taking this data input um, at another point, and um, not a, a clear delineation of what defines this machine learning model. How is this particular machine learning model distinct from others? One the nice things about it are that we can experiment in a notebook. We can often um, execute these things in a, in a uh, Jupyter notebook. We can work with the Python API with, for, uh, uh, with Spark or in Scala. Um, and we can execute that sometimes. And we can just execute the code that we wrote in a notebook and just produce a serialized model. Um, and so this would be maybe the sort of experimenter's workbench kind of style of using Spark to build a machine learning model. Disadvantages of this sort of style are that it's hard to track changes. Um, we don't necessarily have a, a clear idea of um, which code uh, was executed for this particular model after we've serialized it. There can be a lot of repetition with the setup and the configuration uh, and so on with, uh, with a Spark job. Um, and we might not have a stable definition of a model. We can't necessarily refer to the canonical uh, uh, sort of specification of a, of a model. And that can create problems if we have something working in production, but the underlying code that created that um, is, a, is difficult to uh, sort of sort through and find out, well, what exactly went into this model? What, it, or it's, what exactly were its parameter specifications? And so we have a case again for another configuration file. There'll be, there'll be a theme here, so. <laughs> We have another way of specifying and simplifying and basically making the specification of a machine learning model extremely simple and extremely minimal. In this case, we can see that the data frame they're pulling in. So we have some data processing pipeline defined by uh, a Yabi file, another configuration file. And this is the sort of input. So this is the defining the data pipeline that we're going to be actually fitting, fitting a model to. And then we define our model pipeline. Um, and th in this case, we see an example of uh, a model pipeline that includes one-hot encoding uh, and the encoding of, other, uh, of several features, one-hot encoding of a country, city, and title feature, and the numeric encoding of job age and job title length. And then we have the specification of our training. Um, and so this, in this case, we have a random, for, a random forest model, a uh, random forest regressor being fit against the clicks column um, with the parameters, the sort of hyperparameters of max depth uh, four and number of trees 30. So we're sort of passing all of these things into the underlying Spark classes. And finally, we have a post-processing step, so we are um, going to be saving this model, serializing it in a way that can be consumed in production, 
um, and we are going to be uh, using d several different metrics to evaluate its performance, and we get to specify those metrics right here. So we have R squared, median absolute error, and the quantiles, all of which uh, might be ways that you might analyze the performance of a model from a statistical perspective. So again, a case for model config. No Scala needed, unless you really want it. No rebuilding necessary. One model, one config, and that's really nice because we basically just have a key to refer to between what is in production and what is the configuration that built that. There is, if we want to allow for inheritance between models, the same way that we had inheritance in the Spark context, that can also happen. So we can iterate. We can come up with a file that represents an iteration of another model where we just replace a variable or replace a definition. We have a unified platform for training, evaluation, and visualization. So we can automatically generate a whole bunch of plots of, uh, based off of the last stage of the configuration, R squared, median, absolute error, and quantiles. We can get plots associated with the performance on a test set. And we have uh, automatic serialization into various formats for storing a model and deploying that to production. And so overall, we have a move again from Scala to SQL and parameters, basically just, just keeping the data part, the, part that's, the parts that are most relevant to the data scientist are the parts that the data scientist is working with, the things that define the data and the things that define the underlying model. We, get to, we went from a system of building it new every time, starting a new project every time, reinstantiating Spark instances, getting all of that stuff every time, to, to an ability to inherit config and leave the project as it will uh, leave the project in a steady state. And a transition from kind of a lab code system where we might be executing from a notebook and saving things uh, from an experimental context, uh, serializing um, them for, produc for productionization. Um, into a system where we have one model, one config. We have a deep, a, a very easy tie up between what's in production and this, the configuration file that, from which it was specified. So speaking of serializing models and taking them to production, I'd like to welcome Avad back up to take us through big, no, big move number four and five. All right, thank you very much, Brian. Isn't that exciting? simplifying your model uh, developing process with Yabi and model config. So with that, our data science scientist team was able to generate lots of models for us to deploy. And from engineering side, we are running into a problem. Oh, we need to deploy them quickly in our production. So we said, okay, let's automate this model deployment process. So a big move of how we automated that. Just a quick recap of where these models are used that our product uh, that allows our employers to post jobs on Indeed, we recommend a budget value when they are trying to, where they are sponsoring the job. So based on the competitiveness of the market and job title, we recommend a different value for different employers. Not only that, with the recommended value, we also show them how many applicants they are expected to see for given next four weeks. So not only we are recommending a value for them, uh, how much money they should spend, but we are also predicting the value out of the money they are spending on our platform. This is a very interesting use case of a machine learning model to provide, hey, you are going to spend $10, and this is the value you are expected to see out of those $10 on Indeed. And as you can see on the right side, we are also doing these predictions in different markets. For example, here is a, on the right side is an IKEA job posting in Germany, which has completely different characteristics uh, compared to US markets. So how does the models get there into the product, generating predictions? In, when we started this project in the beginning, it was not easy to see, uh, get the serialized models into our product. And especially data scientists, those who do not have engineering background, it was very confusing for them. It was really like wrangling pigs, but with our engineering processes. And as I mentioned earlier, the product we are integrating into is one of the business critical pro product, where we do not want people with uh, limited exposure to engineering practices to cha make changes to that product. So 
from engineering side, we came up with an abstraction called model metadata. So that all a data scientist has to worry about is provide set of metadata about the model they have built and hand it off to engineering where we can easily integrate into our products. So we get a happy data scientist. All right, so let's look at how we simplified this model deployment process. At a very high level, we can break, it, break down this deployment into three sub-steps. First is model integration, where uh, we integrate uh, serialized models into our code base. Next is testing. We test our integration, make sure that it's generating the right set of results. And once we are satisfied with that, we release it into production, where our clients can uh, see the new predictions generated by these models. So first, let's take a look at how we simplified our model integration steps. Like I mentioned earlier, we came up with an abstraction of model metadata, which basically simplifies a set of parameters of that model and how we can easily integrate with our product code. And yes, it's a config file. Again, we love our configs. It makes our lives much easier to abstract the code from the data parts. And so we can also track any changes in the data side separate from the logic side. Here, a model metadata contains a set of information about the model. On the top, it says which serialization format it has used. Also, it shows the which prediction name. Uh, here it's a clicks, meaning that it is being used for predicting clicks. So it allows us to you integrate with the right business logic in our product. And also where this model is located. So all the files, uh, the serialization files, and if there are any encoding files for uh, feature transformations, uh, the integration step can pick it up from there. Next, it also contains a version information about this model so that any changes uh, to the same business logic with the new model, we can track using this version tag. Any debugging processes are used. Uh, they use this version information uh, and tag it into all the logs so that we can find out what's going, if there is any issues with the model or it's taking too long to generate predictions, we can use that information. And we also force our data scientists to write, hey, I own this, I created this, so that when things go wrong, we can blame on them, not us. <laughs> so that comes in handy from engineering side. Not too much to data scientists. And sometimes also uh, model serialization libraries that we have used has limitations of its own. Uh, sometimes if they are internal, we can make changes to them. But if it is an external pro product, then you do not have access to source code and make changes to it. So some parameters of the model that are not, you are not able to serialize as part of the serialization step, you want to also pass it down to the engineering to so make sure that the model is initialized correctly with the right set of parameters. So we allow through this metadata uh, configuration to provide these parameters. And we make, uh, and the engineering side, we make the right set of changes in the code base to understand them and create the model object correctly. So with using this metadata, now we have automated our model integration step that our code base is just able to scan this uh, metadata file and initialize the model object from all the serialization files and uh, parameters that are needed. Next, we were running into some challenges with the features. And those who are not familiar with the features in terms of data science, it is basically an input to your model. So for each model to generate a predictions, a set of features are required to pass it on. And the model transforms that features into a prediction value. But when we started deploying these models in productions, we found out that when a model is trained, it is using a lot of different data sources like ARC, Imhotep, IQL that Brian mentioned earlier to extract these features and do the ETL processing. is again like extract, extract, transfer, and load. 
So that ETL processes was used in feature extraction and set of features are created passing and are passed down to model building process. And in our case was model config. But when we deploy this model in a production, we do not have access to those same data sources because either they are not accessible or they are taking too long to access the data at runtime. So we need to extract all this information from the incoming request. Because of the restriction in the toolings and environments that are different in the production versus the training, we, do not, uh, we were forced to write, replicate the feature extraction step uh, into our products. So there was like in uh, the code base and all the processes were not always in sync compared to when the model was training versus when the model is deployed. And we did run into a lot of challenges at the time of integration. So to simplify that process, we came up with an uh, agreement with the data scientists that you have to treat each feature or each, each input as an immutable key value pair, where key being the name of the feature that you are using for the model, and the value is your data value. So any change into either key or the value uh, requires a new version of that feature. So that simplified our life is that if uh, once a feature has been defined in production and in training, it is immutable. So nobody is going to change that logic. If they want to change the logic, we want to create a new version of that feature. And we are looking into improving that further by exposing set of features that are available in product back into the training step. So that our model config that Brian mentioned earlier has, let, uh, has a set of uh, columns that are basically set of features for the model input so that a uh, model config process can uh, look at what features are available in the product. And if some uh, data scientist is adding a new awesome feature, but that feature is not available, then a uh, config step will generate set of warnings. Hey, you are trying to use awesome feature, but that is not available in product. So make sure that if you want to deploy this, connect, uh, contact the engineering uh, people and make sure that it's gonna be available. Next is testing. Testing is very important. And before, especially for the models that are integrated in products. So when we integrate a model with the metadata file, our code base is able to scan this model and able to initialize the object with our integration step. With that, we wrote set of unit tests that allows us to do continuous testing at the integration step only. So when a model is being built with the new metadata file. Our service is being built with the new metadata file. A set of unit, unit tests will make sure that our integration is correct. But integration is not the only type of testing you, need, you want to do. You also want to make sure that the outputs that are generated from these models are also correct. So we do end-to-end -end model testing where using a test file. So metadata also uh, can point to a test file location. Basically, it's a JSON file that has set of inputs and expected outputs for those inputs. So with our continuous integration pipeline, now we are able to also make sure that our integration work correctly and also the outputs that are generated by this new model are as expected. Once model is tested and is okayed by data scientist and engineer now is being released so that our clients can use those new predictions using the model. But there were some challenges in that to simplify that our release process. Let's look at how we simplify it, how we make it simple. So just a high level overview of that once the model is being released, meaning that it is now generated generating responses or generating predictions for the incoming requests. When we started this project, we started with a very simple global model where we created just a one model that was deployed and was generating predictions for the whole world. But soon we realized that 
yes, to improve the accuracy of our models, we need to build a more regional model. Specifically in this example, we created models for Britain, US, Canada, and India. And so now we added five more, four more models in our system. Not only that, we, want, we need to route the request that has a country parameter to the right model to, to get the more accurate predictions. Later on, we also want to make sure that some countries that have multiple languages, their, the market of predictions also shifts. That Canada with the French job description and job title has a different behavior than the English. So to further improve the accuracy of our models, we need to have this hierarchical model selection logic in our product. One really interesting feature that was actually not from data scientists, but from our product management people that they want to A-B test our model deployments. For those who are not familiar with A-B testing is that uh, you basically, all the incoming requests are broken down into test groups. For example, here you can say a test group A and test group B. And you, you want to route the request to the right test group and expose the output of the test A to group A and output of test B to group B. And then our product management people, they analyze the user interaction, user behaviors of these groups separately to see whether a new model in model in test group A is more accurate or is actually moving the right user metrics or is model B. And then finally they make a decision to which model to keep. So to support this feature, we needed to route the request, incoming request, and dynamically assign it to a right test group and write, route that request to the model that it is assigned to. So again, yes, we created a config file for it. This is a simple routing config file, as you might have expected, where we, it's a hierarchical JSON format, where you have a set of tags, or the key values are being, either it's a country or language, and here in Canada, it's pointing to a right model URI. For A-B testing, also we leverage the same config file so that we have one view of the routing logic where a test group is also uh, as a type of a key and all the groups are point to the right model. And again, when these model, uh, when any changes to these config files are being done and are tested, we make sure that the model is available and if not, then the, we, are, we basically uh, kill the pipeline. We do not allow you to uh, release, that more, release that change in the config file. So the big move that we have made in automating our deployment step is moving from manual integration to a metadata-based automated integration steps. From limited testing to automated testing, with integration and per performance with the test files. And from static routing code to a routing, dynamic routing config that also supports A-B testing. All right, so models are now deployed, but we need to make sure that they are behaving correctly. Like Brian said, sometimes they do not. And this is, models are not like a fixed code that they, they will always behave the same. Let's see why is that we started monitoring three key things of these models. We wanted to make sure that these models are generating prediction in timely manners. So we started monitoring the latency of these models. At Indeed, we use Datadog. Uh, are anybody familiar with Datadog? Yeah, it's, it's an awesome product where you throw in a bunch of metrics and they create awesome dashboards for you. Right. So we started doing the same thing. We uh, created a bunch of metrics re related to our model performance and expose it to Datadog that allows us to monitor that continuously. But again, nobody wants to keep looking at the dashboard all the time you do, or you want to hire a person just for that. Right. So uh, Datadog allows you to create alerts uh, for uh, you can set up set of thresholds and if your latency is increased, uh, goes higher than that threshold, an alert is sent to your Slack channel or email, and then you can, again, with engineering, all we do is look at the log files, blame the data scientists. Now, because we know the authorities. <laughs> but it's, it's really important that we monitor these 
uh, because our product is a business critical product. Next thing we want to monitor is features. Because features, as I mentioned earlier, is basically inputs to the models. And here, the inputs to your models can vary. As in, in this example, think of uh, a very, say, blue bar is the set of inputs that your model was trained with. And the distribution of that was very limited. But when you deploy it in the production, now you are exposed to more different types of inputs. And the distribution of your input actually shifts and is completely different than the, when the model was trained with. Now, it is important for data scientists to keep an eye on it because if the distribution shifts significantly, you want to say, hey, well, maybe the model is not uh, good enough for the current market trends. So we need to rebuild the model and redeploy it and start the whole process again. So we started monitoring these feature inputs. And the last thing we want to make sure that our models are accurate, right? And how do you uh, measure the accuracy? Well, you measure the real world behavior and compare with the predictions. So we did that. Uh, when our model service is generating all the predictions, they are logged into our IQL indexes. And after set amount of time, for example, if the model is generating predictions for four weeks in future, then our evaluator service will kick in after four weeks, will collect all the data from other Indeed services to collect, hey, how many actual applies did this job get? And compare that data with our prediction logs and generate a report for our data scientists to, make sure, to look at, to compare the accuracy of these models. And again, this is all automated uh, tools, so we do not need to go and trigger this pipeline. It's always continuously evaluating in the background. And this is a type of report that you get after doing this evaluation that, hey, model A, accuracy was everywhere, all the place, but model B is more accurate. So then our product manager can come in and say, okay, now in your A-B test, we have enough evidence that model B is more accurate, so we can turn down the model A and just shift it to model B. And for us engineers, all we need to do, okay, yeah, we'll remove that routing config file and we'll do redeploy. So simple change as that. So again, the big move that we have made in monitoring is moving from unknown latencies to continuously monitoring using Datadog services, from silent feature shifts to feature monitoring, and from ad hoc model evaluation to continuous evaluation. With that, I'll call back Brian to wrap things up. Thanks, Avad. So yeah, we just to review things, review everywhere, the uh, kind of geography of where we've gone. We have navigated basically this entire chart, which is pretty impressive. Um, but really, you know, talking about things at the abstract layer of um, what exactly are the steps that we want to get to, down to the kind of uh, key sort of technological uh, contributions to making this process easier. Um, and it's been a great collaborative effort between data scientists and engineers. Um, and so with that in mind, uh, I'd like to say just thank you for everyone that contributed uh, at Indeed. Uh, this is far more than the work of just us two, um, and it's been a great project to work on. And I think with that, um, we would love to take some questions.